Hello, my friends, and welcome back to our MRI physics lecture series on pulse sequences. We're going to get a little wild today with this thing we call echo planar imaging. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. And if any of you find these helpful, then like and comment on the videos and consider becoming a member by clicking the join button below. And with that, let's get started. As a quick recap, on the previous lecture, we developed what we called the gradient recalled echo, where we came upon two critical points. The first being that anytime we apply a gradient field, we cause our protons to precess at different rates, causing dephasing which degrades our signal. But perhaps most importantly, we learned that if we reverse this gradient field with a so-called rephasing gradient, we're able to somewhat reverse this dephasing, bringing our protons back into phase with one another to produce an echo. Naturally, we called this our gradient recalled echo, or GRE for short, and it's unique in that it does not need a 180 degree rephasing pulse at 1 half TE to produce an echo as we need it in our spin echo sequences. But we ran into this problem with imaging time. We would have to repeat this cycle 128 or even 256 times in order to generate an image. And so we pioneered our turbo or fast spin echo technique, where we applied multiple 180 degree rephasing pulses to produce echo after echo, which significantly reduced imaging time. But when we tried to make our gradient recalled echo faster with our so-called multi-echo GRE technique, we hit a wall. Because there are no additional RF pulses injecting energy into the system, we could only produce a few extra echoes before the system becomes so disordered that we have to do the big reset. So where do we go from here? We've pioneered two distinct techniques for generating echoes and images, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. So is there even a need for other MRI sequences? Well, despite all the progress we've made, there's one major limitation to both of these techniques no matter how clever we get. Both of these will require multiple cycles to build an image, and the disadvantage to this is we'll have longer imaging times that are more susceptible to motion degradation, and for some information we may want to get out of the image, these techniques are just not fast enough. So let's pretend for a moment we aren't technically limited in any way and free to design any sequence we want, with the only goal of making this process as fast and efficient as possible. So what's the biggest hurdle we'll need to clear in order to achieve this goal? Mainly, we wouldn't want to have to repeat this process 50 times, let alone 128 or 256, whether it's our GRE or spin echo sequence. These cycles are quite a drag on our imaging time, right? We're trying to make a Ferrari sequence here, and these are dump trucks. So in essence, when we say we want to make the fastest sequence possible, what we are really saying is we want to acquire all data points in a single cycle, and the only way to do this is if we can find a way to keep this echo going, so to speak, negating the need to repeat these pulse sequences. So let's start with our standard spin echo sequence as a backbone for this yet-to-be-named Ferrari sequence we're trying to create. Why the spin echo sequence and not the GRE sequence? Well, we know this sequence has better potential to produce multiple echoes as seen in our turbo fast spin echo technique, and oh do we want to produce multiple echoes this time. For now, let's not worry about this phase encoding gradient, or this frequency encoding gradient. We know that because we applied this 180 degree rephasing pulse, we'll generate an echo that looks like this. But as we showed in our previous gradient echo lecture, the second we turn on any gradient field during this echo, it'll cause either dephasing or rephasing depending on the direction, and this will directly affect our echo. So what if we could find a way to prolong this echo, stretch it out so to speak? Instead of the small wimpy looking echo shown, what if we could find a way to use our gradients to manipulate the echo, dragging it out over a longer period of time as shown, and in fact make tiny little echoes within the overall larger stretched out echo profile. The way we're going to do this is by rapidly oscillating this frequency encoding gradient back and forth, causing rephasing then dephasing, rephasing then dephasing, rephasing then dephasing, over and over again on top of this background echo that emerges from our rephasing pulse. Now I know this can be hard to wrap your head around, but just remember that if we do nothing at all, our echo will naturally develop as shown and quickly dissipate. 
but by rapidly oscillating this frequency encoding gradient back and forth, causing rephasing then dephasing over and over again, we sort of smear this echo over time by creating little echoes inside of it that follow the profile of the original spin echo. We're in fact creating gradient echoes inside of a spin echo, and you can imagine the technical challenges engineers were faced with trying to develop electronics able to perform this rapid switching of current and polarity. And if anyone has had an MRI or works around MRI machines, you know they can be really noisy, and this noise is due to these electromagnets being rapidly switched back and forth. So we've developed a method of creating hundreds of echoes in a row through this mixed gradient spin echo technique, allowing us to generate an entire image of a slice of the body in a single cycle. But is this an image of anything we can recognize, or are we still missing a major step in the image formation process? What about our phase encoding gradient? We have to have this in order to generate a recognizable image, right? So to do this, we will blip our phase encoding gradient on while these frequency encoding gradients are switching over. Now, if you've been following along with a lecture series up to this point, you likely have some questions. In all the sequences we've covered so far, our phase encoding gradient has looked like this, representing a different gradient strength for each cycle. But in this Ferrari sequence we're creating, our phase encoding gradient looks much different. How are we able to get away with blipping the same phase encoding gradient on like this? The answer is not simple, but remember that in the other sequences, we repeated the cycle over and over again, whereas in this sequence, it's all being performed in a single cycle with multiple frequency encoding gradients. So the phase shift we induce with this first phase encoding gradient will persist throughout the sequence, and our second blip of the phase encoding gradients adds to the first, the third adds to it again, and so forth creating a new unique phase encoding gradient just before we turn on our frequency encoding gradient and record the signal. Sometimes you'll even hear this frequency encoding gradient termed the readout gradient, and that's why. Now as things get more and more complicated with a sequence such as this, you can see that this concept of a single echo occurring at TE can't really be applied in the same sense it was previously used. And interestingly, we don't necessarily have to use a 90 degree initial RF pulse to start this. So we commonly use this alpha to denote the fact that this initial flip angle can vary. This is beginning to look like a legitimate pulse sequence now, don't you think? If you could pick a name for this sequence, what would you call it? Yep, that's right. The Uber Fast Spin Echo Sequ- Oh. Well, looks like they didn't continue with the spin echo one-upmanship on this one, and like with any breakup, decided to start fresh. This sequence is the generalized form of what we call echo planar imaging. Now warning, this term is confusing in that it is used in a general sense to refer to sequences that are super fast and usually acquired in a single cycle. And this pulse sequence shown is the basic backbone of this sequence family. Echo planar imaging is not a term that I find intuitive, but if you associate anything with this term, it should be that it's fast. How fast? Try a whole slice of the body in as little as 20 milliseconds. This is the Ferrari, or whatever your favorite hypercar is, of MRI pulse sequences. Nothing is faster. But as always, with great speed comes great… Uh, image degradation. There is no shortcut in MRI physics. The faster we go, the lower the resolution our pictures will have, and the noisier they will be. And what about image contrast? Like we saw with our turbo fast spin echo technique, there still is an overall decreasing T2 something happening. But again, our basic concepts of how our TE and TR parameters affect contrast get even more complicated with this sequence, with some of you might noticing we don't even have a TR in this sequence. But you can see from this curve there will at least be a degree of T2 weighting. Let's point out a few other features of this pulse sequence. Remember that this is a combination of a gradient recalled echo and spin echo sequence, so we still need to perform the initial steps we use to set up both those sequences, as well as other things that we'll cover later. And this first part of the sequence is sometimes referred to as the spin preparation module, while this other section is called the image formation module, the part of the sequence where we actually record the raw data to build the picture. So why would we want a super fast sequence that has poor resolution, high noise, and questionable image contrast? Well, what if we don't really care about how good the picture looks, but instead want to see something really subtle? Like how our signal changes when oxygenated blood rushes into active neurons and releases oxygen into them. This is the premise of BOLD, 
blood oxygen dependent imaging, which forms the basis of functional MRI. And it requires a sequence that can quickly form an image and be run again and again as you see here because the signal changes are so very small and any movement by the patient decreases the accuracy. And when you're operating in sensitive areas of the brain, you want as accurate of an image as possible. Another scenario. What if you want to detect the signal changes when water molecules randomly move throughout the brain tissues? This is what we do in diffusion weighted imaging, and again we're not looking for a fine picture of the brain, but rather very subtle signal changes that require multiple applications as fast as possible to minimize patient movement. So while this sequence may at first seem useless, it's actually perfect for things such as functional MRI and diffusion weighted imaging. And again, keep in mind that the term echoplanar imaging is a general term encompassing a family of super fast sequences built around this backbone of mixed gradient recalled and spin echo techniques we formed in this lecture. And in fact, we already covered another echoplanar technique. That's right, our lecture on the haste and single shot fast spin echo sequence is a variation of this echo planar technique that gives us a little more contrast than our usual echo planar sequence at the cost of slightly lower speed. So we've done it. We've pioneered a blistering fast sequence that allows us to do incredible things such as see relative neuron activity and water movement within the brain. But there's a slight problem, particularly when it comes to the second example. In this current form, we can't actually detect water movement, at least not on the level we need in order to detect things such as strokes. Is there a way we can modify this sequence to improve our sensitivity? On the next episode of MRI Physics Explained, we build off the lessons we developed in this lecture and take a deep dive into diffusion weighted imaging, a very cool imaging technique that I guarantee has impacted the life of you or a loved one at some point. Please like the videos and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this content. Click the join button to see additional ways you can support. And we'll see you for the next episode of MRI Physics Explained. This is Dr. T.E. signing off.